guys, what is up? Welcome back to the range. We are here once again with our friendly neighborhood, Gun Santa, Glenn. Thanks again. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> and he did bring us some very fun gifts today that we're going to take a good look at. So um, once again, we're going to do some studio time and talk about these things. Um, and then we're going to obviously shoot them because we're here at the range. So M14s, we're getting into it. All right, well, I am ready to do some shooting. Absolutely, that's what we brought him for. So what's the, um, what do you think is the progression here? Where do we start? Well, these two are, are standard M14 types. This is a Springfield, this is one of the early ones from the 70s. That's an arm score of Maryland that was made in the late 80s okay. right off of GI parts. And this is a, was the prototype Springfield that was made in the 80s as well with a Nigerian stock on it. All right, well, I think we should probably start in the 70s then. That feels right. Absolutely. And we'll just go from there. Back to the 70s, love it. Back to the 70s. I would have loved to spend some time with you in the 70s, Glenn. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, what can I say? All right, that was easy. Yeah, I just pull the charging handle back and then let it slam forward. Does it go all the way forward? Yeah, looks like it. Okay. So okay. far, so good. Should be ready to rock and roll. Gonna have to disengage the safety though. That's just on the trigger, so push that forward. There you go. That way you can always tell by with your trigger finger where yeah, the safety is. Yeah, as soon as your finger goes in there. Yep. That's nice though, because you can just flip it. Yep. Real easy you with your trigger finger. I like that. What do you think of a battle rifle? <laughs> a little bit different than the M16. Yeah, it for sure is. How's yeah. it feel to you? Well, we, I mean, we talked about this in the studio, but it just still seems, I mean, all the guys who are carrying this as their like standard issue battle rifle, this was like their primary, their go-to. Uh, that was a pretty, that was a savage time. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a pretty gnarly, this is a pretty gnarly weapon. <laughs> Lots of dust. Well, we'll move on to this guy. We'll see how that feels. We'll just do yeah, about the same. The stock's a little bit different, but uh, you're not locked in there. This is one of the wood stocks rather than the fiberglass stock. Yeah. Other than that, it's essentially the same. We'll just do three to five on this guy just to see how it feels. That one feels a little softer to me. I don't know if it's just... A little, little bit more weight. A little perhaps. heavier, yeah. It's a little heavier. And this one, for some reason, as I was shooting, I was feeling the stock shift down on my shoulder. I'm not sure if that's just how I was holding it, but that this one, for me at least, felt to stay a little better in place mm -hmm. on the shoulder, which was nice. All right, let's do a couple on this one. Hey, this one's gonna feel quite a bit different. I like that safety. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a different sound to it? 
Yeah. Different sound, super different feel. Shorter barrel, different muzzle brake on it. Yeah, the whole thing, the whole thing feels different. And that is not a setup that I would want to have if we were shooting full auto. Never shot one in full auto with that stock. That would be interesting. <laughs> I don't think it would be very nice. <laughs> we'll go one more. Now you see where the Mini 14 and some of the others have taken their inspiration from. Yeah. Very definitely scaled down in size, but uh, same kind of, kind of mechanism to it, same feel to it. That, yeah, that is really nice. I mean, I say it's, I say it's gnarly. It's not. It, the, they handle that 7 2 by 51 cartridge super well. Mm -hmm. It is a whole lot more horsepower, yeah. front end and back end. Yeah, for sure. Because this is yeah. the one that was slipping down on me. And we'll see if that actually helps me. Really, I didn't. Uh, I didn't shoot enough times for it to really come all the way down snug on my shoulder. So my like natural placement, it's not. Uh, like I think it's one of those better ideas that wasn't. Yeah. If you will. Yeah, it's a good. It's definitely a good idea, but yeah, for sure. I mean, for me and probably a lot of people, like the natural placement of it, it's not like really firm there. Which is fine. Try this one. See if it's the same. That one actually feels a little better to me. But maybe I just like that gun more. <laughs> I think I like the wood one the most, actually, which is different than I would have thought. Just like, yeah, just looking at them and having talked about them in the studio. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, for sure, I like the way that wood one feels the most. It's got a good solid feel. It's uh, very similar, very reminiscent to the Grand, uh -huh. if you will. And uh, yeah, I prefer the wood too. Yeah. And I mean, you definitely think it's nice to go lightweight, but for sure the heavier, the heavier build just handles the, just handles the cycle better. Well, here again, we're at the range. We're not humping across the... <laughs> True. Out in the boonies. Yeah, actually. we just had to bring it from the car to here, so... Yep. <laughs> weight's not too much of an issue. So what do you think now that you shot them? Uh, Have you shot any battle rifles before, or has everything been a little bit smaller? Or? Yeah, everything's been a little bit smaller. Like, I don't even have a ton of time on, like... I mean, I've shot 308. I've shot 653 more. Um, but I don't have, like, a ton of time behind those guns, and so... Uh, yeah, not a lot of battle rifle experience now that I know what mm -hmm. really what a battle rifle is, right? We talked about that uh, But I mean, it's great. I, I definitely think for me, you know, if I was gonna build out something Like similar to this, I would go the AR-10 LR-308 route just because That's, that's what a I'm, platform you're familiar with. That's what I'm familiar with. Yeah um, But I mean these are these are great and they're awesome and they're iconic and they're definitely a lot of fun. Very robust, very few mechanical problems ever. Yeah. I mean, like anything, you could break a firing pin or extract or something like that, but generally speaking, they hold up very, very well. Well, yeah, and these are, these are old. You've had them for years and years, and I mean, you say this about most of your guns, but they just keep on going. I've run a pretty fair number through that one you've got in your hand there, too, so. That's definitely what you want out of a firearm is, you know, we want them we come shoot them for fun, but at the end of the day, like we want them to work no matter what. So. Well, when I got this, I actually traded away, sold away my HK91 that I bought back in the 80s, because at the time you couldn't get spare parts for it. Magazines were hard to find, uh, and I wanted something that I could get spare parts just in case. Yeah. You never know what was going to happen. So I sold that away. That was back when they were a few hundred dollars instead of a few thousand dollars, and I bought this. Well, RIP to your 91. <laughs> That's too bad. But this is great, and it has worked for you all these years just fine. And yep. 
and I love it. And it, that, that's the whole thing about guns. There's a lot of different guns, there's a lot of different good guns. You need to find what's best for you, what yeah. works best for you. Yeah, and hopefully even to this day, it's easier to find parts for yeah. you know, these things. Mm -hmm. Especially with some of these companies that are continuing to make like newer models and similar models. And, yep. All right. Well, I think somebody else should shoot this a few times. Yeah, it looks similar to one of the Smiths ones. Now we know, if someone's got to take a shot at 100 yards with iron sights, definitely trust Glenn, not me. <laughs> you were right in there though, it would, your, your misses were barely misses. That short one is awesome, but yeah. it also, that stock's not great. It's cool, it's not great. Try not to break it. I will try. Be shooting with that one for too long. Not too long, yeah. Uh -uh. Ooh, I I build up some muscle there. there. All right. This feels weird. I like that it. like weird bridge right there that just knocks into your collar. Button. It's fairly low. Yeah, that one you have to hold a little higher. You honestly might be shooting right through it. Yeah, probably am. Just straight through. Yeah, that does. It's yeah. Yeah. But it's so cool. <laughs> I guess I might be my yeah. intro. Yeah. 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 Boy, you hear the brass coming out. That's weird. with the collapsed and full. It just feels different, but trying to like, I feel like I'm gonna hit myself in the head without the buttstock. Yeah, when it's collapsed. Nice. There you go. Oh, first shot Hugo. Okay, lean, lean a little bit forward into it, like that, yeah. Man, that thing is... You, you do what a lot of people do and tend to want to lean back on it, and that 
makes the recoil more, it makes it a little harder to control. Okay. So if you lean into it, even even bend on your knee a little bit, on your on your left leg, bend into it a little bit. Yeah. And then your whole body's gonna absorb it and you're gonna be able to control it and be right on a lot better. Cool. What is up guys? Welcome back to the studio. Justin here with DTT and I'm gratefully uh, once again joined by our friendly neighborhood gun guru, Glenn Parshall. What's right. going on guys? Thanks so much for and being gals. here. And I'm sure we've got some female viewers too. You know the percentage tends to be pretty low but they're well, out know. there. But they're hardcore. And they're definitely here for you, not for me. <laughs> Don't let my wife hear that. <laughs> So we have some pretty interesting, fun firearms to talk about today. I'm very excited about it. Let's just, I mean, let's just kick this off with the basics. Let's get right into it. Why don't you tell us what we have here on the table? What guns are these? And where did these come from? Okay, well, we'll dig in there. This is something a little different that we've done. This is what's called a battle rifle. Now we've done some other, we've done some machine guns, we've done... So, you know, like an AR-15 M16, which is a, a different platform type of a thing. But this was a firearm that was developed after the end of World War II. Uh, wars, unfortunately, have aided in the advancement of technologies for firearms. A lot of things change because of wars. And, and uh, they started World War II using bolt-action rifles and the advent of machine guns and things of that sort. They became basically obsolete. So they're looking for new things. In the 1950s, they were looking for a new rifle. Now, they still had the idea of a battle rifle, which is a big, heavy platform uh, to use rather than the lighter things that we've gone to since. Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a second, mm -hmm. just because I was not really familiar with the distinction between like battle rifles and assault rifles and a lot of the, the guns that we're really familiar with until kind of I was just reading up for this video. Mm -hmm. So what makes a battle rifle specifically? Battle rifle is a full-sized gun firing a high-powered cartridge, a full-length cartridge. An assault rifle by actual definition and not California politician definitions is something that's capable of select fire with an intermediate power cartridge. Got it. The 5.56 is a much less powerful cartridge, much smaller, much lighter, much lighter platform. And that becomes a quote assault rifle. Uh, that was something that came out at the end of World War II. Germany with their MP44 was the first assault rifle, if you will. And uh, it later on became the AK-47 and then some other things. But this is still a battle rifle, a full-sized gun firing a full-powered cartridge. Uh, if you look back, you, you, you've seen over the years, uh, we've gone to smaller and more effective rounds rather than the bigger and heavier rounds. Uh, we're not... Put, we're putting a lot more small bullets down range rather than the fewer large bullets like when we did the Trapper Springfield. Yeah. That was a which single is, shot. Which is good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just the, the further development of a, of, of a platform. We love all sizes of bullets for different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. They all have a place. All have a place. But that's basically the, the, the outline of what a battle rifle is, is a full-size gun firing a full-powered cartridge. Okay, so the battle rifles are, they're the big boys. Mm-hmm. We had the M1 Grand, which is probably the most common or popular or well-known battle rifle of World War II, which is what this was developed off of. Yes, After the war, you can they definitely see yeah. yeah the similarities. Well, they took the receivers, and there were there were several shortcomings to the Grand. It was a great rifle for the time, but it is warfare changed. It it wasn't going to fit that role. You know, after that point, they took the receivers, they were able to shorten them because we had advancements in gunpowder technology so we could have a shorter cartridge that would get the same kind of ballistic energies and what have you. And we also wanted to have something that had a detachable magazine rather than the end block clip that fit inside the eight rounds, you know, a little higher capacity. 
Uh, so it, it, they developed the detachable box magazine, which we had seen with some of the you know, submachine guns that we'll have in World War II. Uh, smaller cartridges, but still the same idea. A lot easier to reload, a lot easier to get more ammo in and out of the guns. Uh, so that, that's where this came from. We went this route. Uh, Italy went a little bit different route. They took an M1 Grand receiver and developed the BM-59, which is a similar but different type of a rifle. It, it also uses a short receiver. It also, if you have an M14 parts kit, you can take and build a BM-59, so there's a lot of the parts interchangeability. But a slightly different magazine. That magazine down there on the, on the, the studio right there, this is a BM-59 magazine. And you know, this one here, closer to you, that's an M14 magazine. So they're, they're similar but different. They hold, both hold 20 rounds. Um, both very robust, made out of you know, good solid steel. You can stand on them. Uh, they're, they're very durable in, in battle, that kind of a thing. Double feed magazine. Hmm. So similar but different. They, they, they don't interchange. The dimensions are different, but they, they, they served a similar purpose. Uh, the, the M14 initially came out to replace three different platforms. Uh, first off, your squad automatic weapon, which is what the BAR that came out in 1918 was doing, a more sustained full auto fire, a heavier gun. Uh, the M60 after that was the next generation of it, if you will. It came out to replace the battle rifle, which the M1 Grand, and then before that the O3 Springfield. And it also, believe it or not, came out to fill the role of a submachine gun. Which, looking at something this large and this heavy, it's kind of hard to imagine this as a submachine gun. Yeah. But that was the select fire. And here again, they were trying to figure out where these different weapon platforms would fit into the more modern battle battlefield. Yeah, the the fact that this was meant to take the place of something like a Tommy gun mm -hmm. was probably the option at the time. It, it doesn't. It does. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. It does not really compute to me. Uh, yeah, but obviously, like. Well, the grease gun was also available in World War II, and that that filled another role. That's another small, light, uh, as we think of a submachine gun today, much smaller, much lighter, but uh, it was very crude by comparison and, and uh, I mean they run great if you ever get a chance to shoot one they're, they're, they're wonderful guns to shoot but uh, there have been other advances there were other guns out at the time from other countries that were probably a finer or better or more dependable you know platform in that role so this was in its conception and its introduction was meant to be kind of a catch-all do-all pretty much pretty much yep firearm that we were replacing Something mm -hmm. we were replacing something that was like pretty big, and you're kind of medium size and you're mm -hmm. smaller size. Yep, this technology's changed, uh, and the whole idea of, of of warfare and the battle operations changed. Uh, this fit into the steps there as we go down to the smaller sizes. Uh, this came out in the 1950s. Uh, countries were rearming. Um, we had Korea going on. You know, there and we had a lot of problems in Europe. Uh, Russia was flexing its muscle over the, the 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 countries that they now control. Russia was flexing its muscle. Oh yeah, are I'd you never sure about that? that? <laughs> but uh, so I mean, the the the, the conquests were far from settled at that point. So countries were looking at new equipment to arm and, and changing things out. This was initially the T48, the, the, the prototype of it, which is very, very much identical to this, or a couple of minor changes they did. Uh, there were other guns that uh, were in the same time frame, like I said, the BM-59, which we talked about a little bit, and then of course the FNFAL in the different configurations that is. Those were probably the three primary ones. The uh, Russians were developing the AK-47, and that was being issued to the Comblock countries, except for Czechoslovakia. Now Czechoslovakia had very good gun designers and they came out with their own guns which in many aspects are superior to like an AK-47 of the time but Russia wanted them to use Russian guns so they wouldn't let them do that wouldn't let them use them. What was Czechoslovakia putting out? Uh, they, they were... <laughs> I'll think of it in a second here. Brain fart <laughs> time folks I have those two <laughs> and I've even got a couple of them. Um, That's fine. We give me a minute we'll get we back can, to that. We can cover it in another episode. That sounds great. <laughs> We have a couple of them, so yeah. we'll definitely be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, fired the same round, but it, it was a similar but different, a, a much improved platform. The AK-47 has been improved, 
uh, the Galil and, and some other things where they've taken and refined it a little bit. AK-47 in some aspects is a little bit crude. I mean, talking about the early ones, they've done oh, yeah, for sure. a lot of changes, you know, since even the Russian side of things. But uh, so this, this came out, this was what we went into Vietnam with, was the M-14. Uh, the, the M1 Garands at that point were relegated to National Guard units and, and uh, military positions, guard duty, that kind of a thing. Uh, they used those. They still kept making them up until the early 60s, so it was kind of an overlap in things there. But uh, kind of brings up a, a, a question that I ask, and I very seldom get an answer. When was, to my knowledge, the last fixed bayonet charge of a U.S. military unit? Well, I know the answer to this because you told me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead and say it then? I don't. I don't remember exactly what and where it was, but it was. Uh, it was State a college University. campus, yeah, right? Kent yeah, Kent State University, where the National Guardsmen with their M1 Garands fixed bayonets and charged up the hill. And unfortunately, a number of college students got killed, and it was a big fiasco. And there's uh, 16 sides of the story, you know, on the thing, pretty but, wild. <laughs> But as far as I've been able to find, that was the last fixed bayonet charge. But anyway, getting back to this platform, uh, the, in, in Vietnam it was used, it was used uh, very well, but it was also used very poorly. Uh, a, a friend of mine that, that, uh, that I've spoken with quite a bit, he was in Vietnam for a number of years, uh, he loved his M14, they took it away and gave him some other things, and uh, he kind of bemoaned that he never quite got over it because he knew his M14 was dependable and going to work. Uh, some of the things that they gave him were prototypes, experimentals. Uh, some other things were more tried and true. Uh, one of the missions that he went into one of the countries that we don't or weren't in, uh, they gave him a totally sanitized Smith & Wesson Model 76, which is a 9mm submachine gun, without any markings because we didn't want them to know that we were in their country. You know, a lot of those kind of things go mm -hmm. on. But it had some problems. Uh, in the jungle environment being so big, I mean you're crawling through swamps, you're crawling through vines, you're crawling through bushes and what have you, and this, this longer type of a thing didn't uh, lend itself very, very well to, to, to fitting into those things. Yeah, it's not a mobility, uh, it's not exactly a mobility-minded mm -hmm. yep. design. Big, big and heavy. And VZ-58 was the Czechoslovakian rifle. There it is. I knew I'd think of it here in the middle of something, so sorry about that. Yeah. But. Uh, this was used in early Vietnam, and then, of course, the M16 started being coming out in the mid-60s and, and replaced it, uh, took it away. So in, in a battle role, this rifle served a very, very short time in duty. Uh, it was uh, essentially issued for about eight or nine years. Uh, it's still being issued today, so it's still being used. Matter of fact, the very first Desert Storm War, uh, when we were going on board the naval blockade and going on board ships, a lot of the guys going over there insisted on two things as far as guns. They wanted a 1911 and 45, and they wanted an M14. They didn't want the then new Beretta M9 because they didn't have confidence in the 9mm round. And they wanted something with an, enough firepower that going into hardened things, metal walls and things of that sort would have a little bit more punch. And so the M14 was desired. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of them going around because in their infinite wisdom under the Slick Willie administration, they chopped most of them up. And they actually had to go out into the civilian marketplace and buy spare parts so they could go ahead and rehab the ones that they still had in inventory. And then actually take those into service. Yep. That, wow. That's a chopped and demilled receiver, for instance, from that era, where the receiver's just plain cut in half. Perfectly good rifle, chopped in half. Wow. We should have a moment of silence for the chopped receivers. <laughs> Could have brought his brother. I've got a couple of them. <laughs> That's good. But getting back to the, the operation of this, it's great as a battle rifle. It functions very, very well. Uh, it's got decent optics on it. We had uh, the M21, which was the sniper version, which the uh, addition of the Leatherwood scope, which is the, that's the second generation Leatherwood scope, one of the civilian ones, but it's made patterned after the original one. That's one of the ones when Leatherwood was in Las Vegas and uh, you know made them for a few years. Uh, very good scope, uh, and, and it served very, very well in that. Uh, I neglected to bring the scope mount, and I apologize on that, but they take a very specific scope mount that would replace the, the stripper clip guide here, and then there's a screw hole on the side of the receiver, and so you basically had it up and over. It's kind of similar to the AK-47 mounts. Mm -hmm. They're mounted on the side and then up and over, and it provided a very stable platform here over the action. There was still plenty of room for the spent cartridge to be ejected out of the way, but the scope was at the proper position for it. So, how often were these being used with stripper clips? 
Quite often. Okay. Um, that's basically the way that the ammo was issued in five round stripper clips, and you put it on there, take your thumb, and load it that way. Uh, that way you can load in the middle of the battle. You're not sitting there with loose cartridges. Is, is sh you know, things are happening and bullets are flying over your head. <laughs> you know, so you can load it pretty quick uh, by comparison. So uh, just leave the magazine in place and run your stripper clip in there. You'll still find a lot of the 308 ammo comes out in stripper clips five rounds. Because these all except box mags. Mm -hmm. All yep. three of these. Yeah. Okay. And you would have the box mags loaded up ahead of time, but if you had to reload in the in, in the in the field, yeah. you'd use the stripper clips to reload them. Yeah, because you're only you only got twenty round mags, as I'm mm -hmm. sure as high as they were going at the time. And yeah, and they typically would carry about four spare magazines plus one in the gun. Mm -hmm. uh, here again, you start getting up to a fair bit of weight. Things get pretty heavy pretty quick. They do. Makes a difference. Makes a difference when you have to hunt a heavy package like that. Yeah, it is so interesting to me to think about. You know, having your your primary uh, your primary weapon option is like such a large platform. There's no pistol grip, large round, heavy recoil, uh, and you're shooting twenty round mags full auto. Mm -hmm. the, the whole, I mean, obviously, it's just that's all based on like the things that I know as far as from my generation and what I've shot full auto and. We build things so differently now. You keep, different, a, yeah. you keep a smaller platform, like usually a little bit smaller rounds. It's good to have like a little bit different ways to grip the mm -hmm. firearm is what we're used to these days. And so just to think about running around with something that's designed like this, and you're running it full auto, it's so different than, than well, what we're used to now. And that was a recognized thing early on. They did come out with a stock that had a pistol grip on it and one with a, a fold down foregrip. For uh, those weren't widely issued. It was kind of late. At that point, we were already developing and, and adopting the M16 platform, so not a lot of them got rehabbed. That's one stock that I don't have in my collection, uh, for instance, is, is one of the pistol grip stocks. I'd like to get one someday. I want an original one. There have been some aftermarket ones, but the original ones have gotten quite expensive because there weren't a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. But it did fill that role. When we were doing the uh, machine gun range at the Soldier Fortune Convention back in the 80s and 90s, that was one thing we had full auto M14s and people would come up and say that you couldn't fire a full magazine on full auto in one burst and keep it under control. Now we could, and we did quite often in demos, where, where everything is perfect, but it is something that's a lot harder to control and if, if, you, if you don't have the time to position your body just right and stand just right and hold it just right and concentrate on it, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be all over the place on it. So in, in, in a full auto roll, it, it was lacking. Uh, you know, you, there's a bayonet, I mean, there's a bayonet mount there too, but a, a bipod mount on these so you could put a, a bipod on it, basically clamped around there, but it still was not as sturdy of a platform as what you would like, not as sturdy as what the BAR was mm -hmm. uh, or the M60 afterwards. Now, with, with a belt fed, you've got a lot better ammo capability or capacity for that type of a thing where you could have 50, 100 round belts away instead of a 20 round box magazine. Mm -hmm and quick change barrels. I mean, you burn out the barrel on this, it's gotta go back to the armory to be rehabbed. Uh, these other barrels are quick change, so you can change them in the field. Any idea how many rounds it would take to burn through one of these barrels? On full auto, you could burn through it relatively quick, and when I say relatively quick, I would say probably, if you're doing sustained bursts, you know, long bursts, uh, you could burn it out in 10 to 30,000 rounds easily. If you're doing three and four round bursts, it would be a lot longer to, to, to wear it out. Uh, but if you're just doing mag dump after mag dump, you're going to uh, road the throat quite a bit in the barrel and, and burn them out pretty quick. So it, it just depends on how you use it. Uh, everybody loves to do mag dumps. I mean, every time we take people out to shoot machine guns, they want to do a mag dump, 20 rounds, 30 rounds, whatever, and just run through it. And that's cool, and that's a lot of fun, but that is not the best way to shoot uh, for longevity of the guns. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, if we're thinking about the gun... Well, we kind of have to to a certain extent because... You know, some of the things that we've taken out, I can't replace. For sure. You know, they, they're just not available anymore. So uh, we, we want to think about those things, and especially something like this where the barrel is quite a bit harder to change. I don't have the tooling to change it. I could get it, and I could figure out how to do it, but it's not something that uh, most people, even people that, that tinker on guns like I do, would be able to do at, at home, you know, without specialized tooling. But... Uh, 1974 Springfield Armory came out. It was a civilian Springfield Armory. 
Uh, the military was not, or the government was not using Springfield Armory as a name anymore, so they came out and started making guns. Uh, this was basically the first thing that they did. This is an early Springfield rifle here. This is using all GI parts with a new made receiver. And this one's a, a, a low five digits or mid five digit serial number, so it's going to date probably around 1980, give or take. And uh, as time went on, they started making a lot of the other parts as they were running out of parts. At that time, there was still a lot of surplus parts available that they could go ahead and get their hands on. I tried to buy my first M14, or M1A as Springfield call it, uh, in the 70s. One of the engineers that I was working with back when I was a rocket scientist uh, had bought one and decided he didn't like it and was going to sell it to me for a very good price. And I was going to have the money on Tuesday. When we made the deal on Friday and I came back on a Monday and he went and traded it in for something else for about half the price of what I was going to give him for. So I missed out on my first one way back when. So Sometimes it just can't About wait. 10 years later before I got my first one. <laughs> also in passing, that sounded like a joke, but Glenn actually was a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a previous life, yes. <laughs> Worked on weapon systems of all kinds, what can I say? But... Uh, I thought it was you a pretty can't good bring thing. one of those in for a video, can you? Uh, no, no, no. They frown on the things like that. <laughs> a little big for the parking lot, too. regulated items. Yep, yep. But it was a fairly popular platform. Of course, Springfield went on to come out with the line of the 1911s and the SA-58 and, and uh, various other guns, and, and they're, they're still going strong today. Uh, they still make M14s or M1As. They make them in different configurations, but now they're entirely made by Springfield, all the parts, no more GI parts. As you look at it, things on here, for instance, you can see the mark here on, on, on the thing, you can tell you that was made by TRW, uh, they're, they're one of the contractors that made parts. And you see, you'll see that on the, the bolt, you'll see it on there. the off rods and things of that sort. That's H&R, yeah, Harrington H &R. Richardson. Yep. H&R, is that the same H&R that makes my 10 gauge shotgun? Yep. Yep, yep, exactly. Uh, they were a military uh, gun provider. They made a number of different things, and they made parts for other things, and uh, made very, very good th things. And we think of H&R in a lot of the guns that they made before they went out of business as being cheaper guns, and they were, but they, they were actually well-made cheap guns. And uh, their metallurgy is every bit as good. Uh, you pay more for a Winchester part just because it says Winchester, but it's not any better as far as function. But uh, they work very, very good. That one that you're resting your arm on there is one that came out by a company called Arms Corps of Maryland. They came out in the mid to late 80s, uh, again using GI parts. They, they went through and matched all the parts up. So if you bought one of their rifles, you had all matching parts <coughs> as far as manufacture. That's all H&R parts in that. And uh, I got that. I sold my HK91 at the time. Uh, that time you could not get spare parts for it. And I was kind of worried about being able to replace a firing pin or extractor, so I went with this because I knew it could get spare parts. Better platform, not a better platform. That's one of those things you want to argue about, but at the time it seemed like a good option to me. And I've had that one ever since. So it's it's been with me quite a bit. It's the one that I've shot the most. Uh, we run a fair number of rounds to it. We used to do the walkabouts down there in the desert in Vegas. And uh, even when I would carry a heavy thing like this, we'd, we'd go out and shoot it quite a bit. And, you know, pick out rocks at a couple 300 yards and, and, and pick them off and we'll have you with it. So, um, I spent a fair bit of time with that rifle. <clears throat> so, looking at what was like the most common use of this when it was a service rifle, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we already discussed it was kind of introduced to replace three different things with three mm -hmm. very different functions. What was this most widely used for and then I'm asking because, you know, you're saying you were picking off rocks at 300 yards. What was probably, like, the, what's, at what range is this effective out to, and how often was this actually used for that purpose? Uh, several hundred yards. Being a 308. Uh, yeah. I mean, in, in a lot of them, they, they made uh, basically accurized versions, sniper versions. The M21 uh, has a different locking lugs and things in the back to, and, and different type of sights on it, but th those are used out to 1,000 yard matches all the time to this day. The 308 cartridge and this platform are still used in that platform. There are several companies that make match grade M1As, M14s, whatever you want to call it, uh, for that kind of shooting, for that kind of distances on it. But it, it, it served the same role as, as a grand, so, you know, a 500-yard shot was not out, out of the realm of the average rifleman, uh, you know, with, with some training being able to use it, even with the standard sights that are on it. The, the, the sights are adjustable for elevation and windage here, and uh, uh, 
actually very very good sights as they go they're they're fairly tough they're they're protected so if you drop it you're not likely to break it uh, as far as breaking the, the sights off and what have you so well designed from that platform and then with the addition of this the, the scopes and what have you it, it extended the range quite a bit the scopes were not generally issued that was more for in the sniper role uh, Carlos Hathcock and people like that that used it um, Jim Leatherwood there, there are a number of names that uh, were famous snipers from the Vietnam era, and, and that that scope was developed you know, around that time frame for it. So it it uh, it'll, it'll run those today. We have better ammunition today. We've done some changes again in the chemistry of the gunpowder. We've had some new designs in bullets, and uh, with these more accurate platforms, they'll they'll very definitely keep up at the thousand yard range. And you see, in things like that, it, it, it was a very very good platform for uh, you know a sniper rifle. It, it's capable of sustained fire. It's not going to be break or be damaged or you know things of that sort you've got a much better firepower than you would say with a bolt action rifle which is you know what a lot of the sniper platforms are on so it, it, it makes a lot of sense people think that a semi-auto can't be as accurate as a bolt action and, and maybe when we get down on paper and get the micrometer out to measure it yes but for that type of a role it'll keep up very very well and have uh, increased firepower increased uh, rate of fire on it yeah. So this rifle was first created, first came out, I'm assuming, in a uh, configuration that was probably most similar to this of the ones that yep. we have here mm -hmm. on the table. Yep. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, the variations that came thereafter and kind of where this went from there. I know, I mean, this came from the Garand. And then we got to this point, kind mm -hmm. of what what sprung from this. I know we have uh, there's an EBR 14, which is mm -hmm. a version of this. Yeah, and there, there have been a number of the th things along that line made by various companies that are all based on the same same platform. Is a different rifle? Is the same rifle with modifications? I lean toward more towards the, it's the same rifle with modifications. Differences in they they change on the the action to make it a little bit more accurate. That type of a thing. But uh, you, you'll find that most all the parts are going to interchange. Cool. <clears throat> and like everything else, I've gone ahead and, and procured a few spare parts for these just in case. Yeah. Firing pins, extractors, bolts, you know, things of that sort. Uh, just don't want to be without. It's a good investment, though. They keep going up in price. So. Well, yeah, none of it's going to get <laughs> easier to find. Yeah. This particular type here was something that came out. Now, it's crinkle coated on the top, but underneath here, you can see where it's kind of scuffed up. You can see the, the brown of the fiberglass stock underneath. And that was just a little bit lighter, just a little bit smaller. If you notice the hand grip area here is just a little bit smaller than on the wood. Yeah, it's slim, a mm -hmm. little more low profile. And, and so this this was issued quite a bit. Most of the <clears throat> nylon or the fiberglass stocks uh, got pretty well chewed up and beat up, so you don't see those as available in, in good condition. And then, like I said, you had the, the pistol grip with a fold down uh, fore end. Uh, same same gun, just a different stock. This one here in the middle is something that came along in the civilian world. This also came out in the 1980s. It's a Springfield Armory. I want to talk about this guy for sure. Sure. Now, they, they had come up and developed what they called the bush rifle, which was the shortened barrel. You see it's got a little bit different flash hider on it, yep. a little bit shorter barrel, but it still had the same stock on it, so it made it a little bit better, but still kind of a long gun. Uh, the, this is a folding stock off of a Nigerian BM-59. And they only made, I've heard, 150, 200. It was just a limited amount that they made with that. They couldn't get a sufficient supply of the stock, so they came up with a different folding stock when they started issuing this or started make, you know, making it in quantity. Uh, they're not in the current production list, if I recall. Uh, they still make the bush rifle, but here again, they're back to the full stock. So it's a matter of getting something robust. This is a, a real good stout stock. I mean, it, it's every bit as strong as a, as a, a full stock on it. Well, when we had it before we started filming, we were folding it up and what have you, and, and it takes some oomph to get it to collapse and what have you there. You squeeze really, really hard Just there. Okay. Pop that in and then that folds. Mm -hmm. Then folds around, and now you've got a much shorter platform. That actually is, is, is my most favorite one of these to shoot. This thing's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I haven't shot it. You will. But I like it. You will. And it feels, obviously, like I was saying before, it feels a little more... I guess familiar to me because mm -hmm. you know I shoot ARs, group, yeah. I shoot AKs, so having that mm -hmm. grip and having some know, sort of collapsible or yeah. folding type stock, yeah. 
and then it's a little bit shorter. It feels a little bit more familiar mm -hmm. size profile. The carbine that we are all familiar with, carbine length. Yeah. But this thing is really cool. And one of the problems with a lot of the folding stocks is they're not stout. And they wouldn't hold up in a battle type of a situation. They're going to break. This one, I mean, you, yeah, could you break it? Sure. Yeah, you can break anything. But it's something that's designed to, to hold up under very adverse conditions. So yeah, I, I'm glad I was able to procure that. I bought that, came into my shop back in the late 80s, and I didn't recognize that the value on it, what it was, uh, that they had only made a few. I think at that time they were still planning on marketing them. They were in the advertising brochures at the time and what have you. So glad I was able to pick it up and hung on to it all these years. So, so this, I mean, this gun, this profile, it's, this is a pretty iconic firearm. It's pretty recognizable. Mm -hmm. It looks like, I mean, it's very similar to the Grand, which obviously people recognize. Um, you know, we have this this flash hider on the end that is like really familiar, pretty mm -hmm. iconic look. Why do you think that this particular gun has been able to remain so like iconic and renowned over all the years? I think partly because some of the roles that it's used in. Uh, if you've ever watched this, the the guards at the Unknown Soldier. This is what they carry. If you see a lot of the military tribute staff and what have you, if you've, if you've seen a 21 gun salute, more than likely this is what they're using. Now some of them are going to use Grand, some of them are going to use bolt actions, some of them are going to use M16s, whatever they've got, but you, you do see these a lot. So it, it, it's still out there. Uh, people still see it, still see it in some of these roles. Uh, like I said, it, it, it has a full powered cartridge to it. That's why it was requested for the naval boarding parties uh, during the Gulf Storm Wars. Uh, has a, a much better distance than the M16 556 cartridge would. And some of those, I mean, yeah. out in the desert, they're long distance shots. So, uh, you know, something like this definitely would fill a role, even though it is heavier to dump around. Yeah, and like most of these guns that we're talking about, this kind of fills a really interesting place in the history of and development of firearms mm -hmm. for the world and our nation well being the son of the m1 grand doesn't hurt it either no you know that that is still it's amazing I, I've, I've taken a lot of younger people out shooting over the years and i'm never ceases to amaze me when uh, the group of people i remember i down in vegas the, the, the uh, some of the seniors graduating from high school wanted to go out shooting they had uh, senior events that they could do and, and a friend of mine wanted to take his group of people out and shoot machine guns and so we did and the number one gun that was requested and the number one gun that was used and the number one gun that, that ran up the ammo was the grand really everybody had to shoot the grand the other things were fine and, I, and you've seen some of the things and some things you haven't seen but i mean we took out some fun guns but the grand was it um my youngest son my my, my gun son as i call him uh loves the grand uh, you just it just kind of crosses the generation, you know, if you will, and this is a version, if you will, of the Grand. It's the Grand Action, just modified for a detachable box magazine and a different, slightly different cartridge. So. Yeah, which was a pretty significant development oh, yeah, yeah. for for the Grand. Yep, yep. Going from a five-shot bolt action to an eight-shot semi-auto to a twenty-shot full auto. Uh, Quite a few steps in there. We unfortunately don't get that super recognizable and pleasant ping when you run out of ammo. That's true. That's, that's true. That's too bad. But and dropping the magazine just doesn't make the same sound. Yeah, <laughs> that's too bad. But yeah, that's you know kind of the same way that we talked about uh, you know the when we had the trapdoor rifles and we talked about how big of a development that was to just use cased ammo and not having to be a like a musket muzzle loader pour powder down and stuff a ball on top yeah, of it yeah. just mm -hmm. that step of being able to accept a box magazine was i'm sure like a massive development for people that were actually using these rifles mm -hmm. at the time and that's huge why don't you hand me that demilled receiver there and let's talk about that for a second for sure this is just kind of different this is a receiver that's been cut in half <laughs> so it's no longer functional as a gun i've gone ahead and and uh, just kind of semi put on here the select fire mechanism on here uh Basically, this switch would rotate around. That would be a semi-auto, and then and back over this way would be automatic. It doesn't go all the way because it's not fully mounted, but you kind of get the idea there. 
the idea of allowing the general soldier to switch to full auto was, was not a good thing, so what they quite often did was they took this off, left the rest of the mechanism, and they put a, a round piece on there so that they couldn't select fire it. And that was what was more commonly issued in the field. Because under combat situations, you know, it, it wasn't as controllable and it's too, far too easy to clamp down on that trigger and keep holding until it's empty and then keep holding some more. So it, it, it's a wasn't a good tactical tactical thing to do. So having that ability to change it out, and the receivers are the same, other than the underneath here you can't really see it, but underneath here there's a. Well, let's go ahead and pull this off here. So they actually deemed this like too difficult to use as a full auto. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to... it was recognized fairly early on that it wasn't going to uh, work nearly as well that way. That's the the part here that mounts on. That's the difference between the semi-auto receivers and the full auto receivers. This little tab here on the back end. So not a lot of differences there. And then yeah. of course the addition of these other little parts here. But uh, as you see on the inside of it there, uh, it's got wear but it doesn't have a lot of wear. This was a perfectly serviceable gun uh, that was chopped in pieces. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> they should have kept them. They should have sold them to the public, in my opinion. I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to see a few more of these out there. Unfortunately, I've got paperweights. So in its original configuration, these were select fire. Yeah, all of you them. You can see the the, the, the the hole here where the where the, the, the switch and everything would go through. Now again, w uh, most often when they were actually issued, they were set on semi-auto only. But they had that ability with the changing out of a couple of Change little parts part. that they could make them full auto. It's kind of, kind of like uh, putting the different trigger group in the M1 and the M2 carbine. And were these were these available to civilians from the get-go? as well? No, there are, there, there's a number of them that are in civilian hands. Most of them were made after the, fa you know, after the fact up till 1986 out of civilian guns. Uh, the, the government didn't really sell these as far as surplus, like we, you know, we get the Garands and we get the 1911s through the CMP and things of that sort. These have never been sold that way, but uh, th there are a number of them that were made as full auto guns prior to 1986. Companies were doing them. Sp Springfield, like I said, was in business in 74, so it was a, 12 year period for them, and, and there, were, there were other companies at the time that were doing it too. Unfortunately, like I said, I got that one just after the change. <laughs> it's too bad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else we maybe need to cover on these bad boys? I think we've covered it fairly well. Um, the couple things are a little different. We have a fiberglass handguard on the top. The M1 Garand had wood. This gave a little better uh, heat dispensation on it. Oh, yeah, these uh, all have that. Yeah, and you, you'll see some of them that have slots cut in them. That was something that was done uh, in the civilian world, not in the military world. It makes them quite a bit weaker. These are these are pretty tough, uh, as they sit as a solid piece, and what have you. Um, all of these here have the, the the full auto op rods on them. Now the later ones that are made don't. It's that notch that's cut out there. That by itself will not let it fire full auto. Of course, there's a lot of other modifications that need to be done. But without that notch, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. But here again, these are made out of surplus parts. How long is the barrel on these full length ones? Um, Do we need very good question. I think it's 18 inches, the 16 inches on this one. Okay. But I think well, we can just kind of line it up against each other. Yeah, so it's going to be about 20 inches. Yeah. 20 inch barrel. Yeah. Which is kind of long by today's standard. Yeah. But that here again, from when they were developed, that was a normal rifle length. And that was what was issued. If you look at Garands, if you look at Springfields, all three Springfields and things of that sort, they all had longer barrels. And that goes back to the 1800s. Yeah. Well, and even... Uh, well, even before that. But, I mean, as far as a, a metallic cartridge gun, yeah, yeah. it goes back to the very beginning of it because the gunpowder... Is it over the years it's changed quite a bit and it would require the longer barrels for good complete burns and require the longer barrels for better accuracy. You know, the longer sighting radius you have and, and, and that sort of thing, the longer you have to stabilize the bullet in, in, as it goes down the barrel. Yeah, and as things started to modernize and I mean early M16s and that was pretty Well, look normal. at the first M16s, they all had longer pretty barrels too. barrel length yeah. for, for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I came out with the commando and some of the other things that uh, were issued at first to special ops units and what have in Vietnam where they shortened things down. Everybody was carrying a full rifle. Yeah. A lighter rifle. Yeah, lighter than this for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but still a full rifle. So, 
And, you know, as things went along, I mean, they changed the gunpowder a couple of times. They went away from the three-pronged flash hiders on the early M16s because they got caught up in some of the vines and things. So, I mean, there's always changes that are happening as, as things are going along. We're changing guns today. I mean, they're looking at new calibers and yeah. uh, different and similar platforms, but modifying for quite a bit. So they call it a new model, but it's essentially 80% of, of a previous model, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, even that, the Sig Spear that just got uh, just got the, the military contract that is kind of a weird caliber and mm -hmm. I mean a very familiar operating operating system as far as like similar similar well, guns to that with, yeah. yeah but yeah and, yeah, and seeing new stuff and different stuff and unfortunately the civilian market gets to pick up on a lot of things when a cartridge like that it is adopted by the military it becomes a commercial success fairly quickly as long as it's available um, a lot of things that come out in the civilian world, if it doesn't take off, it kind of disappears after a couple of years. So if it starts getting issued as a military cartridge, it'll be around for a while. All right, well, I'm glad that you have a few of these. And, I am too. And I think, uh, <laughs> They're fun guns. A little higher recoil than some of the other things we've shot. A little different. It's going to be different than like the 4570. And, yeah, that's okay. And, and, and like that. But, I mean, if, if uh, it's... Uh, uh, very controllable, very handleable things. So this is a, one of the guns that a lot of people use for CMP shoots because it qualifies with everything, with the original sights and everything. It is a military issued gun, so it would qualify for that. So one of these days I'm going to have to take one out and do a CMP shoot so I can start getting some of the goodies that they're releasing slowly. Yeah, I should do that. <laughs> I should do that. You yes. deserve it. <laughs> Add something further to the collection. I've enjoyed talking about these. This is a another one of the guns. Of course, I don't know of any gun that I don't enjoy. <laughs> That's what I say. I, I, I always say, I like this, I like the way it looks, but... I well, I, I, I've got to get like away from saying this This is a favorite of mine because they're all kind of favorites of mine. It's like having a whole bunch of kids. I mean, how do you pick the best kid? You can't. So they're all favorites. <laughs> you know? yeah. I've only got four kids, so I don't have that many to pick from, but they're all great kids. But you love them all for different Absolutely, reasons. Absolutely, yep. That's great. And once again, man, I appreciate that you just not only did you bring some awesome guns to the table, but you also you also brought a lot of knowledge and understanding of where these things come from. And that makes handling them and shooting them an even different and kind of enhanced experience. So we appreciate that as usual. Well, if you'd like to know about something other than here, this is how you load it and pull the trigger. Then we got to get into it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And we're going to keep doing it. That's part of the fun for me. I can I can do that anytime. I don't have to wait till the range day. <laughs> I can study up and learn on things anytime. Yeah. All right, guys, there it is, the M14. Uh, definitely a gun I probably uh, need a few more rounds through before I shoot this thing on camera again. <laughs> well, do you know where you can get one? <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, but this thing is awesome. That was a ton of fun. And, um, I mean, as we talked about in the studio, pretty awesome piece of firearms history here in America and, and an, an iconic piece of just the development of, of weapons here. So thanks again, Glenn. We appreciate you bringing these ones out. Absolutely. Always happy to. And I think uh, for our next video, you have something fairly similar that we're going to take a look at. Ah, we might. We might. Okay. No, I know what he's talking about because we've been talking about it. I think if you enjoyed this one, you'll really like the other one. Yeah, for sure. So if you like this, if you like the M14, tune in for the next one. I'm particularly excited about it because it's definitely uh, definitely a bucket list gun for me. So I'm always happy to do the bucket list for you. Yeah, man. So uh, as usual, what everyone else, whatever everyone else's bucket list guns are, if you guys want to see certain stuff, let us know down in the comments because hopefully Glenn has it or something similar. Or we can arrange to borrow one or yeah, who knows whatever. We'll see what we can find. So let us know what you guys want to see, what you guys want to learn about. And uh, we'll see what we can do to get to that in the near future. So uh, once again, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Glenn, for coming out. Sure. Thank you, Jay, for having us out here. And we will see you guys all on the next one.